place that light is afraid to touch. With the monsters beneath your bed and hiding behind your fear, refuse to travel. Do you dare? Is your mind capable of the sights you see? Is your body prepared for the sounds you hear? Is your spirit up to the challenge of what you soon may feel? If so, have a seat with the seductress of the dark, scary terror, the sultan of Satan, Chunky Larry, and the clown prince of fear, Arlie Grind. This is the good king's table. Greetings, fellow insomniacs, and welcome to the table. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ghoul Kids Table Podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. I'm your host, I'm your friend in fright. My name is Chunky Larry, and joining us today is a collection of ghouls that I enjoy quite a bit. We're going to start off with the lady of the bunch, because the lady's first. She's got a smile for miles, and she's the reason that you're here. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Tragic Ra. Ah, the girl who attracts angry ex-Marines. How is everybody doing today? <laughs> I'm pretty good. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, before, we, before we had started, I told you that all of the stuff fell from my shelving right above the laptop because there, I believe, is a spirit that is wanting us not to have this conversation. But Oh, no. The, the power of Chris compels me, <laughs> and it compels me to introduce uh, everybody's favorite Rob Halford cosplayer. <laughs> 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 the, the clown prince of fear, the, uh, the, the, the priest in the church of Wild Zero, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Arlie Grind, how are you doing, man? I'm going to need Aaron to cue the uh, drum intro to Painkiller for this. Uh, honk honk, motherfuckers. I'm good. Uh, I'm good. Uh, I'm, we're, we're, we're discussing a, a, a film that I absolutely love today. So, uh, very excited. George Heath Scott. And we've got one more person here at the table. It's not just the three of us as it usually is. We've got somebody special here at the table. He is the reason I got into horror talk. Like that's a that's a shoot, and I had told him. Um one of the most unique voices on TikTok, in my personal opinion. And uh the guy who will tell you all about Jason X. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Andrew Horror. Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I'm the guest today. I wore my guest shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank very you. Very well done. <laughs> thank you for thank you for the kind words. I know you told me that before, but it... thank you. <laughs> and thank you for having me. <laughs> We need you to cry just more. Good. Actually, you are amazing. Cry. I'll, I'll, I'll keep. I'll just like love bomb you till you cry. I think that'll, that'll, that'll be guys, good for this. Yes, I can't. More it. tears. Hashtag more tears from the guests. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Andrew, I just want to say, uh, just kind of echo Larry's sentiments. You're one of the first accounts that I followed on TikTok, and uh, instantly fell in love with you and oh. all of your content and your insight on horror movies and your skits just everything is chef kiss you you oh. are you are the the king of horror talk oh my, all hail the king stop it thank you thank you so much that really means a lot for real i know i joke and like that really means a lot oh thank you so much and I'm nobody special, though, you guys. It's There are better people out there than me. All of them. All the people are better than me. No, no. no, <laughs> no. Not in our eyes. Not so, in our eyes. So uh, one of the things that we're doing this month on the show, this being the first episode of the month, we have a theme. The theme is, Rory, you want to tell them? 
Ooh, the theme for this month is March Madness. We're doing um, all psychological horrors this month. And one of the things that we do when we have somebody join us at the table is they bring something to the table for us to discuss. And Andrew, you brought something pretty girthy, I would say. <laughs> Hashtag, Hashtag bring that girth. girth. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Andrew brings girth to the table. <laughs> oh my god! So what don't, did you, don't worry, what did you don't pick, worry listeners and viewers. It's not going to be one of those episodes. Um, Maybe, sadly. Ooh, Maybe. <laughs> There's no guarantees. We have no guarantees. But what did you bring uh, to us? Um, The Exorcist Three. I don't know the tagline. Evil the kept going. <laughs> it's like Azuzu gets an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> it's the tagline's something about the stairs. It's like, do you dare walk these stairs again or something stupid like that? But they're, they're yeah. barely in the movie, though. I mean, yeah, I know there. that's the thing. And they're all, like the poster is yeah, the, the stairs. The marketing's all around that fucking <laughs> flight weird. of stairs, and then it's they're weird. in there for like half of a fucking second. It, it makes no sense. Uh, <laughs> but I, I feel like, to me, this movie kind of it it gives you preconceptions because, uh, and and I mentioned this to the other the ghouls, uh, but I haven't mentioned this to you. This is the very first time I've ever seen this fucking movie. Oh wow. I'd never uh, seen I, this movie. I'd like to chime in too. This was my first time as well. I thought I had saw it when I was younger. I did not. So this was my first viewing as well. Wow. I've seen this movie like a hundred fucking times. Cool guy. Me too. Cool guy. Me too. Cool guy. And, um, so I don't know about you, Roar, because you also had seen it before, but I walked in with preconceived notions as to what we were going to be getting. And it's not that at all. Like, no. like in any way, shape, or form, I, I, they get there eventually. You know, there's actually an exorcism in this movie called The Exorcist, uh, <laughs> which I was very concerned wasn't going to happen. <laughs> I was like, "Where are we going? Are we going to ever bring a priest in here? <laughs> do we do we get a well? Priest? There's a priest. There's some priests. There's priest. I mean, like there's there's <laughs> you you get you get a, you get more than one. You you get a. a... The plethora of priests. I mean, just... a... <laughs> four, four or five. You get four or it's five. a girthy amount of priests. <laughs> yeah. It's a girth load of priests. <laughs> Hashtag girthy, girthy priest. <laughs> Hashtag girthy priest. <laughs> Hashtag uh, Catholic school children are having flashbacks. Oh. 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 That's how that good one. Judas Girthy Priest. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Anywho. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad the theme didn't like go over you guys' head though. Mm-mm. Like, nope. nope. Not at all. This is, this is nope. intentional. Mm. I don't have a collar, so I <laughs> like, I, I know what I'm getting you for your buy. birthday this year. <laughs> I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do, right? Oh, fucking A. Uh, but again, uh, I just felt like this was so far from what I had expected when I was walking into the film that it took me a little bit of time to really understand where we were going. Like it, like it felt like it was building to something, but it was actually building to something else, and it, it's still ultimately the same thing. It's just the the way that the film is laid out is totally different than what I had expected it to be. Larry uh, and Sarah both, you guys have seen Exorcist too, right? That monstrosity that is monstrosity. That is a that is a. I feel like I feel like and, I've seen that. Like there, there's something I, I with a, it. Yeah. It, it's like an insect flying or some shit. I think that's why a lot of people haven't seen the third one is because of the second one being such a hot piece of garbage. 
Yep. Um, and, and a it, lot of people really just, is. just tapped out at that point. Like I'm not watching the third and honestly, I don't remember my reasoning for not watching it. So I'm not going to make anything up, but, um, I do remember seeing the second one and that is, a it's a movie. <laughs> yeah. That's actually why, um, William Peter Blatty who wrote and mm-hmm. directed it didn't want it to be called the exorcist three. Because he's like, people are going to think this has something to do with The Exorcist 2, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, he just wanted to call it Legion, which is the title of the novel. Mm-hmm. Or, or um, like, Legion, The Exorcist. Like, don't put the three in there to make it seem like it follows two. But, you know, the studio decided it's the third one, The Exorcist 3. I guess. I, I don't know. I mean... And that is definitely why this movie people I've talked to people about the exorcist three, like on TikTok live, I bring it up all the time and I've had multiple people tell me like, Oh, I thought I was supposed to stay away from that one. Or that was the bad one or something. I think uh, I'm like, I think you're thinking of the exorcist two, And just the fact that that movie is pretty much widely maligned. Is that a, is that the correct word? Yeah. Um, people just assume that the Exorcist three get like is, or they don't assume, but it does get lumped into or with the Exorcist two, which is unfortunate, I guess. Well, it depends on how you both feel about the movie, I guess. If you think that's unfortunate or uh or not, but well, we've actually had this conversation on the show before that at one point in time, sequels were just you you just knew a lot of sequels were going to come out and they were just going to be shit. They weren't going to be compared to the originals, and that's why yeah. you don't see. Yes, you have the iconic franchises and you have a few gems here and there, but um, I don't know. It's to me like I I think throughout all of the nineties there were a ton of movies that just. As soon as there was a sequel, you were like, no, you know, damn well, that's going straight to home video. That's not getting a release. That's, you know, they didn't have budget for it. Mm-hmm. I think that was the norm for a while. So yeah. it's very easy to kind of dismiss sequels, um, particularly uh, particularly if, you know, that second one was such a clunker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excluding, of course, Troll and most of the Hellraiser se- uh, sequels. Those are all pretty great. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 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 That seems fair. Oh, but, but you totally <laughs> left out um, Bud the Chud. You know, Chud. Oh, Chud. yeah. Chud, too. Can't, can't forget that. That classic cinematic master- master, masterpiece. Amityville, oh, 1992. It's about time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen. Not a terrible movie. I'm just gonna throw that out there. <laughs> I mean, it it it's no fucking Amityville fucking was it Dollhouse? Dollhouse, yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. oh, oh. Guess what I just watched? Hmm. Amityville Clown House. Cool guy alert. How many fucking Amityville movies are there? Seventy-three. <laughs> well, the thing 42. is, forty-two. Amityville can't be like trademarked, so anybody can make an Amityville movie. We should make an Amityville movie, actually. Should, I think Amityville that would be a lot of is. fun. Yeah, the Amityville table podcast. Just random yeah. references of peen and clinky drinks <laughs> at the 3 o'clock in the table. morning. <laughs> the <Amityville> table. <laughs> it's the pop- Amityville table. Probably already been done, to be honest. <laughs> Somebody did something to this fucking table. <laughs> so, so they they knock down the house, and someone goes and takes the scrap and builds a haunted table. <laughs> the table's just hey, going listen. around eating people, levitating. Somebody put a fucking table together with the scraps of the house. And then somebody came on a Ouija board on top of that table. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, was that a was that a wounded fawn reference? Yes, <laughs> furiously <laughs> masturbating onto the Ouija board that's on top of the table that is made from the fucking bones of the Avenueville house. Netflix uh. would greenlight it. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, uh, we got to talk about fucking Brad Dourif. 
we, we just we got it. Oh my god, <laughs> that fucking performance was out of this world. Like he 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 does something that really fucking lends to what this character is in the sense that he pulls himself out in and out of what he's you know it, so it's like his his facial mannerisms and, and and everything about what he's doing when he's when he's the gemini killer he's intense but then he's other things and he is legion he is he is multiple things and it's uh, uh, gemini is the astrological sign that represents the twin and he has the twin of father Karis, which i thought was very interesting because in certain points you see father Karis, in certain points you see the gemini mm-hmm. killer because he's sharing that body the the mm. the corpse of father Karis. yeah and you know it, it's it's a it's a battle of wills and at certain points you hear him say i'm tired and it, that happens a lot kind of throughout the story or the film what did you guys think of brad Dourif in this Ooh. so good if anybody knows me they know how much how big of a child's play and chucky fan that i am child's play is my third or fourth favorite franchise i love every movie i love chucky to death but this is my favorite brad dura performance um it's amazing to put it in the simplest terms and the um the wild thing is that brad Dourif was originally cast to replace like he was recast so he was supposed to play father Karis and the gemini killer um originally played by jason patrick's dad of course everybody knows that <laughs> <laughs> and then um because jason miller had some issues some alcoholic substance abuse issues and they feared that he wouldn't be able to remember the lines or give the performance that, that they wanted Mm. Um, and then for some reason after they filmed like they wrapped filming they decided to do reshoots and they brought in Jason Miller to replace Brad Dourif so they were going to cut Brad Dourif out of the movie completely because they got Jason Miller and then Jason Miller wasn't doing such a great job so they were like okay this is what we're going to do we're going to bring Brad Dourif back so uh, Brad Dourif already filmed and they brought him back to reshoot all of his scenes. So all of the scenes that you see in the movie are actually reshoots, which he says aren't as good as the original performances that he did. He said, what's in the movie now isn't what it should be. It isn't great like it should be, which, like, I want to see that original footage if he's saying Hell that. Yes. Yeah, like, exactly. holy shit. <laughs> exactly. And then, I mean, so, we, like, we, it was... Oh, go ahead. I, oh, I, I, I was just just gonna say like we talk about um uh, like oscar worthy or award uh worthy performances and and brad delivers one and yeah just knowing that those are reshoots i can only imagine i can only imagine how fantastic those original shots were yeah and i wonder if they're if they're out there or like i have the scream factory blu-ray but i've, I've never like I know I've watched the special features, but I can't remember if any of the original footage is on there. I would love to see it. Mm. Um, I know, I know, I haven't seen it. If they are on there, I haven't watched them, but that's something I'm going to have to seek out because I just can't imagine how it could be any better than what's in the film now. That entire movie could have been just him in that cell talking. And I would have been perfectly cool with that. That was an incredible performance. What I loved about it is the way he carried everything off is that when he's describing these murders and these horrific acts, he's doing it with such detail that they didn't have to show you anything. It was just him talking. And that was so effective. His performance was so 
beautifully done. Um, it just it kind of hit you right in the face a little bit. You're just like, oh, OK, this is fantastic. I I believe everything about this. I don't even think this is Brad anymore. I really do believe that this is <laughs> the Gemini killer. now. Yeah. And the Gemini killer, um, wasn't that also um, based off of the Zodiac killer? Yes. Okay. Yes. And it, it's only counterbalanced by the performance of George C. Scott because there are there are fucking uh, so the movie to me it's in three gears and and it's you know you're you're coasting with that first part that first portion is really establishing everything and and you get to watch George C. Scott slowly unravel to the point that he gets to the point where he's talking to patient X and it's like a totally different movie from that point on and it amps up the intensity so like when his friend is killed and they have the jars of blood is you know him him seeing his friend in that fashion is very reserved but by the time you get to patient x he is no longer fucking reserved he is completely fucking unhinged and it only gets worse from that point on and uh, so it, they they do this thing where they're doing kind of a slow reveal of violence uh, that escalates over the course of the film uh, where you don't see fucking shit until damn near the end of the film and then at the end of the film they really show you some stuff <laughs> and, uh, and so i just that was something that uh, you know for being a first time view that was that was something that i was really paying attention to was was this reveal this slow reveal of the violence and then when they do show violence it's so excessive that it, it feels like Ugh, i kind of want to get back away from that and and that to me is incredibly effective because it's again um the things that it makes you feel without you seeing it and and creating a mental picture rather than you know just them showing you everything which was very yes. commonplace at the time this movie was released right we're gonna keep going we got six minutes yeah we got six minutes yeah. six. did you want to stop and uh uh come back or oh well no because we didn't do the end-ables. we didn't do the endables oh uh, shit oh. Yeah, I d- I can I can I can knock it, that out real quick. So. Sure. Uh, before we get going, Arlie, why don't you give us the Imdibles, uh for Exorcist Three? The Imdibles. a seemingly endless series of grisly killings that bear the trademark of the mass murderer, the Gemini Killer, terrorizes the district of Georgetown. To further complicate matters, although it's been 17 long years since the killer's execution and that fatal night of pure terror in The Exorcist, 1973, skeptical police officer Lieutenant William F. Kenderman is still obsessed with solving the baffling case as the death toll keeps rising. In the meantime, in the city's high-security psychiatric institution, a cryptic inmate who bears an uncanny resemblance to the late Father Damien Karras emerges from a deep catatonic state claiming that he has all the answers Kinderman needs. But who is the mysterious patient X? Does the same unholy force that tormented Reagan McNeil have something to do with the brutal demonic murders? Written by Nick uh, Rick Reganus? Reganus. Nick Reganus. Good job. There you go, Nick. Yeah, that was a good one. Was good, good job, one. Nick. I think you did a good idea. A good idea. A good idea? <laughs> Good job. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you did something. You did something. <laughs> it, it was it was idea. words. It was Put words. Together. Might have had grammar. I'm not sure. Good job. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good ideas. And I kind of want to circle back real quick to something that Andrew had said is that the movie was plagued with actors who had drinking problems. 
uh, George C. Scott was very vocal about his alcohol and substance, uh, or well, alcohol abuse and independence. Um, but it's amazing to me that someone who had such a severe issue with drinking was able to deliver it, not only in this film, but pretty much every single film that man has been. He, I'm a huge George C. Scott fan. And um, watching him kind of make that transition from drama to, to horror films, this isn't his first. Um, he's, he's, got a, he's got a few notches in the belt. Um, but this one, like, just wow. Like, we've got George doing amazing stuff and and he's bouncing off uh brad which oh god like just those two performances alone make this an instant classic in my opinion and and any actor would be actor should watch this film and just watch because brad is he's on a he's on a bed the whole time he's not moving around he's not up and down he he's very limited and so all of his acting is here it's all here and delivery of the lines and everything else, I just fucking, and he gets wow. to do a single tear because you know <laughs> Fred Durf needs to cry. That's how he comes. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that Brad? Is that Brad come? <laughs> Brad oh must cry. <laughs> that, that's... That Brad must cry. <laughs> I have it in my oh, contract Lord. that at least once in the film. Tears must come out of my eyes. <laughs> he cries in every role, doesn't he? Yes, every. Yeah. He's got a leaky problem. You know? Lord, Lord of the Rings. Uh, Lord of the Rings was the first one I thought of, play, but I'm pretty sure Luke, his eyes were uh, just uh, uh, watering uh, for all of Lord of the Rings. Oh, what was uh, Larry? Help me out. Trauma. Rats, Stephen oh, King. Graveyard shift. Graveyard yes. shift. Thank you. I yes. just love yeah. killing these fucking rats. <laughs> <laughs> God. But it does. But it doesn't seem. It doesn't seem like anything outside of the characters he's portraying. It works. It works. <laughs> He's, Hashtag he's masterclass on single tier. <laughs> <laughs> single tier masterclass. <laughs> Here at the Brad Durham School of Single Tears. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to be an actor? Well, come to the Brad Durham School of Single Tears, where we'll teach you how to get real intense and let just one trickle down, but we won't let any others out. Because we're actors, god damn it! We're professionals. <laughs> Is that two tears? Is that two tears? Failure. Fail. Fail. <laughs> you will you never act the, in this town. Think about the worst thing that's ever happened to you, but only for a second. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. <laughs> Can kick you in the knee, internalize it for half a second. <laughs> Just half a second. That's all you need, Teddy. <laughs> the heart of this movie is a crime thriller. It's it's about a serial killer, and um, again, I was not expecting that. What do you guys think about the the template for this storytelling? Uh, to be centered around the police and it kind of feeling like a procedural. I love it. I love movies that are like police procedurals or investigations of serial killers and stuff like that. So when you take that and you marry it with spooky demon possession and, you know, you put Pazuzu in there. It's just perfect combination for me. I kind of like um uh, springboard off of what Andrew said. Um, I I I love like true crime um thrillers and yeah uh, investigative stories like that. This actually reminded me of another one that I thoroughly enjoy, and that's Fallen. 
um, with Denzel Washington and fuck yeah, John Goodman. Um, and, and okay. So that was one that I absolutely loved and similar, very similar in story too, with demon possession and cops and all that kind of stuff. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Hashtag and, and fuck yeah, John Goodman. <laughs> Hash, hashtag John Goodman's not dead. And your nose. Mm-hmm. And your nose. And your nose. People watched <laughs> Rose, that last season of Roseanne and got confused. <laughs> uh, I I think, and we have a lot of movies that kind of interweave the, the police aspect. I mean, we reviewed one on here, The Prophecy. We have, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a fallen priest goes turns cop uh fallen's another one uh there's that one with schwarzenegger that's not very good um Kinder- kindergarten cop <laughs> yes yes that's the one twins <laughs> twins <laughs> twins, <laughs> twins. Um, we're talking the gemini York. killer i figured it was twins <laughs> so. but but you and then uh like there's been the hellraiser sequel that involved it and i think marrying these two concepts together makes for good storytelling if it's done well if it's executed well like we just listed off some examples of stories that were done well versus some that were some that were not but uh and it kind of makes sense because if we look at like other franchises jason freddy chucky i guess chucky's got some cops in it but um we don't see a lot of we, we don't see a lot of police involvement, which, you know, people are dying. You kind of think, oh, all cops, you know, that would be a part of it. With Where's a the demon possession, kind of everyone too? automatically goes to priests. No one goes to the cops. But no one goes to the cops. Yeah, but yeah, priests are like devil cops. They're devil cops. Devil yeah, demon cops. cops. Yeah. Demon cops. Hashtag we devil cops. That. We need that. We need a movie now. I think they tried to do it with R.I.P.D., but... Oh, you know, God. <laughs> that took a turn. <laughs> took a turn into a turd. Correct. <laughs> took a turd. <laughs> took a turd. It was the turd. Uh, but uh, I enjoyed it. and I think it works well for this story, especially. And And so... This has a really heavy theological uh, template also. It's those two uh, ideologies warring with each other in the sense that, you know, Kinnaman's character is very much bound by his belief in law and his belief in God is what's called into question. And even, even at the end, he refuses to have it be this faith in God. It's more of a faith in evil uh, than the knowledge that evil exists that is ultimately what gives him the strength to do what he's able to do. And that that's his job is to stop evil. It's not, you know, it's not about faith or religion, though faith and religion are obviously a big portion of this and you know the the exorcism doesn't go very well (laughs) in in the sense that uh like my boy gets peeled like a potato (laughs) 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 hashtag (laughs) mr potato priest (laughs) (laughs) beat me to it beat me to it (laughs) (laughs) so Hashtag not taters precious. (laughs) (laughs) Hashtag priestly taters precious. But I I want Arlie, because I know you have kind of some insight on religion, uh, for you to bring some of that religious funk to the table. Oh, absolutely. Um, So. Oh, that's a lot to unpack here. Um, so religious devotees, uh, which we see within the context of this film, uh, will always fall back on God or the devil 
as justification for why things are. And Kinderman is is the polar opposite of that because I mean he 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 recognizes that evil exists, but he doesn't dive into the motivations or the root of those evils. It's just evil exists. My job is to stop this evil. Where the religious devotee would want to throw all the blame, all the context, you know, whenever something good happens, oh, the Lord has blessed me. And whenever something bad happens, oh, it's the devil. You know, it's just this, <laughs> it's it's always it's always one or the other. There's no nuance in everything. And so Kenderman's character kind of he kind of reigns in that that religious zealotry um that that comes into play uh with the uh priest that is killed in the confessional and the way his his remains are put on display kinderman does not in my opinion he he views it as as a grisly evil murder but nothing more where someone with more religious ties could see what the gemini killer was trying to say with with just how he uh, uh, displayed the body and and how the how the remains were were left. So it's always very interesting to me that <clears throat> when it comes to religion and movies, they they kind of play on these tropes, and this one kind of steers away from some of those tropes. Kinderman and the priests they go see a movie. You know, and they're joking and, and they're having these conversations. They get in that little back and forth in the hospital and everything else. And he doesn't really feel like a priest. He feels like a fr- like like priest is just his job. Yeah. And it, it's he's not. I mean, he throws out a little bit of a, a little bit of a spiritual wisdom, but but he's not harping on it. And, and I think that's what that's an element that makes helps this story and helps this movie be so digestible uh, especially for people that may not like religion very much I mean I don't know very many people like that but I also thought it was really interesting that both of them um, when going to when asked about their plans they both said they're helping the other one that they both are dealing with this in a they have a hard time dealing with it for the other person uh, to not put it on themselves and that they're bonded by that trauma. That trauma is ultimately the catalyst of their friendship because Kinderman's friendship was with Karis through the course of, you know, both of their cases kind of aligning in the sense that Kinderman is looking into the death of a director. Karis is looking into the possession of a child. And those two paths cross, and that's how they become friends. In this, the priest and the cop are bonded by the trauma of the loss of Karis. And it being the thing that brings them back to each other once a year. And they go see It's a Wonderful Life. And, you know... um, that in itself is interesting because you know, what is that movie about? It's about an angel that you know gives somebody a second chance and takes them out of themselves, and that's that's kind of what they're doing with the Karis character is you know he's being pulled out of himself, and they're able to do this thing where they multiple possessions in the sense that. Um, that entity is able to take over the bodies of these people inside of the mental institution. And that's the third element. Um, You know, we've got the law, we've got religion, but then the third element is mental health, you know, father, son, Holy spirit, whatever. Um, Real, real quick, going back to the relationship of the, um, uh, of the two, I will say that, um, in my opinion, allegedly for legal purposes, um, the dialogue between those two was the only thing that kept the beginning of the movie interesting. It was very slow moving. It was very you had no idea which direction we were kind of going, but it was kind of like dragging. 
And I felt like the, those smart assy back and forth quippy conversations with those two actually kind of saved it. Um, and it was almost like they were trying to make it make up for the slow moving with the dialogue, um, at which was really enjoyable to listen to those two. Yes. Um, especially if you have any kind of smart assy friends. Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do we have one of those? Is we have a few. Uh, is, is there any at the table? <laughs> can't think of one. <laughs> no. <laughs> Never. 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 Uh, Sorry. Uh, uh, but the 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 therapist in the hospital, the the main therapist uh, Herschel from The Walking Dead, is enabling this to happen because Genesis or Genesis Gemini. Not Phil Collins. Hashtag in the air tonight. Hashtag do the drum solo. <laughs> but, but Jim and I has gotten into the ear of this therapist, and and he's using him as a puppet to get him into the, get him into contact with Karen, and and that that's fucking wild to me that that's what he's trying to do with him and George C. Scott's just like no fuck you I'm not going to even acknowledge that you're the Gemini I, I, no Gemini's dead he, he sees things in black and white regardless of how colorful everything is and that's it's like um, Batman and the Joker in a really interesting way because that is the relationship with the two characters is the one wants the other to give in but he refuses because of his belief system and his belief system isn't the belief system of religion it's the belief system of good and evil and law and order and uh, uh just what do you guys think of that I think Andrew, Andrew, you should talk a little bit because yeah. you are the guest and you yeah, and we've kind of been like steamrolling through this. And no, I'm... it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um man. I'm trying to like rack my brain around everything Larry just said to come. <laughs> um I think you said it perfectly. Like um in terms of Scott Wilson, who I don't what's his, I don't know remember what his character's name is in this movie. Even though I've seen it like a million times, I can't think of what his name is. But um, the scene there's the scene where he's like or he like has written down and is rehearsing what he's going to say to Kinderman. Um, it's just so weird. Like this guy, he's like practicing what he's gonna say to this. He seems sketchy like right off the him. bat. Yeah, he seems ske sketch lord two thousand. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, I I think there's a it, uh, so Doctor Temple. That's Dr. Temple. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Doctor Temple. I don't know uh, if I do they even say that. Is that, that Shirley's the... uncle? Yeah, Shirley, Shirley, <laughs> Shirley's, Shirley's uncle. uncle. Yeah. Shirley, Shirley's uncle. <laughs> don't <laughs> don't call me Shirley. <laughs> 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 but um everyone seems motivated by fear yeah in in, in this film except mm -hmm. for kinderman i mean kinderman obviously he's afraid for the safety of people and everything else but but it's fear so like with dr temple uh he's being influenced uh by this entity and he's terrified like he doesn't he's no I don't want to die. I'm going to do whatever you say. Uh, and yet he meets an untimely demise regardless. And even, even that, uh, like Andrew brought up, he's practicing what he said because he's afraid. He's afraid mm -hmm. of Kinderman. He's afraid of the entity. He's afraid of everything else. He's, he's, he's just a fearful man. 
who cannot do the right thing out of fear. He, he's, he's impotent with, by, fear, by fear, with fear. And it's a very interesting character who's not in the movie very much, but I think is an essential part of, of this story. And, 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 and just showing how devious and almost powerful this, uh, this, this entity is. It's almost like the Nur Nurse Ratchet character, which that's never fully fleshed out. No. You know? And like, it needed to be. It, it that's kinda, something that needed yeah. to be, yes. Can we it's just like, add, too, that any, any movie that takes place in a hospital, it adds a different level of um, dread for a lot of people um me particularly at one point in time i had a fear of hospitals so and, and i don't know if it's because it's so clinical or because you know what kind of things go on behind the the doors in a hospital i think all, like always being in that hospital was just unnerving and and it you kind of felt that watching this throughout the whole thing I, I do want to bring something up, though, before we get too far in. Can we talk about that dream sequence, please? Fabio. Featuring Fabio. Featuring and Fabio. Patrick, Patrick Ewing. <laughs> and Samuel L. Jackson is we got also in there. Patrick Ewing from the... There's so much <laughs> going on there. Ben, I love... You guys are talking about Fabio. I just want to know, how the fuck did you rope Patrick Ewing into this? <laughs> I want to know that story. <laughs> I, I I really do. Like that's his heyday, 1990. He mm -hmm. was dominating the East Coast. I mean, he was the MVP. And then all of a sudden, it's like I'm an angel. I'm an angel that can dunk on your ass. Yeah, Grand Central Station with Fabio. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag dunk for the Lord. <laughs> I love that. Jesus. I think that. That dream is my favorite scene in the movie, I think. Um, I love the, when he's talking to the little boy and he's like, I'm sorry you got murdered. Like, that's <laughs> just nonchalantly. You, that's something you, that's a sentence you've said to somebody before, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, oh, Mr. Kinderman, no big deal. <laughs> yeah. And then you get to uh, um, Father Dyer, who's, like got his freaking all the stitches and uh he's, what does he say like i'm not dreaming or something like mm -hmm. that which tells you okay something just this happened is, this is real this is uh essentially purgatory i'm guessing that's what they were going for and it's just I know so, my purgatory would have fabio in it i'm pretty yeah, sure yeah. for sure for sure that's <laughs> that, looking too my, we'll see, Mine would have Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. Michael like, Jordan. Just, just saying. <laughs> Mine just, would definitely there's... have dwarfs. <laughs> big booty dwarfs. Big booty dwarfs. <laughs> Hashtag big booty dwarfs. Rolling up on you in a van. <laughs> Hashtag big booty dwarf angels. <laughs> uh, uh, Andrew, Andrew brought up a, a really good point, and I know we, we kind of laugh at that at that line, but I think it's a testament to the Kinderman character. Again, he's just accepting the reality. Of, yeah. You know, hey, I'm sorry you got, like, what else are you going to say? You know, and, and he's just, but he's facing, even in that dream sequence, he's facing life how we would face, or facing death, if you will, how he would face, like, this is just the reality. There's good, there's bad. Good things happen, bad things happen. Hmm. And I, I, I do. do I dream. will say that was one of the things that I may not have enjoyed the dream sequence as much as others because I I'm sorry, but I did find it kind of laughable at that point. Um, but I will say for the rest of the movie and particularly from the beginning on, anytime you get like a, a thought or a a dream or anything, this was jarring. It was very jarring. It it immediately took you into that kind of with no context and i actually found that to be uh very interesting and i enjoy that type of style um of filmmaking and but once once i saw fabio and wings i was like okay yeah no yeah <laughs> so like it's no <laughs> so random it was random 
I mean, and I wonder they how made that sure choice. to pan. Yeah, <laughs> they made sure. <laughs> Fab- oh. Fabio had that in his contract. He's like. You have to linger on me for at least three linger. seconds. I'm surprised he didn't hold up. I can't believe it's not butter or something, to be honest with you. And yeah, I, I, yeah, I wanted to see the hair. No, <laughs> 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 if we're being honest, I mean, that's that's what I want to imagine angels look like. Just, <laughs> just ruggedly handsome Fabio <laughs> with his long golden locks. Just with that jawline and shit. Uh, that's that's my angel. I want to be touched by that <laughs> Bobby, Bobby was Larry's angel. Hashtag. Is he on cameo? Can we get him a birthday present? Hashtag or... Fabio's my angel. Hashtag uh, hashtag touched by the Fabio angel. Uh, <laughs> hashtag touched by Fabio. <laughs> uh, We're gonna let Andrew started us off with the ghoulies. And Andrew, I don't know if you know how this works out, but zero is the lowest. Five mm-hmm. is the highest. How many ghoulies are you coming in with? Oh, and Andrew, if if you give it a half, you have to tell us if it's the bottom half or the top half. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. So, no the, exor- <laughs> the Exorcist 3. Um, I love this movie. It's... I don't even know what word to say like to describe how much I love it. Um, I should preface this by saying, I believe the original exorcist, the first exorcist is a masterpiece. Um, it's one of the greatest horror films ever made. Um, I'm sure a lot of people would agree with that. Um, some edge Lords might not. Um, but this, and one of the big things about this is the friendship dynamic between Kinderman and Dyer and it feels to me like when I'm watching the movie it just seems so natural like it doesn't seem like they're acting it seems so mm-hmm. real and natural and it's like I have to wonder if I know they're both great actors Ed Flanders not to be confused with Ned Flanders from the Simpsons um it's his cousin. and I wonder if Stupid, <laughs> sexy <cousin>. Flanders, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, George C. Scott. I know they're both incredible actors, but I gotta think: are they like were they like friends in real life? So actually, just, listened, it seems so. I listened to an interview with Ed Flanders, and he said that he had only met him like once before they See, actually done the movie. And that's crazy, and that's just a testament to how great they are. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like um, I love everything about like the super the paranormal demon possession stuff that's cool obviously i'm into that shit but like if this was just a drama and it had them two in it i would still love it and um and i always forget that father dyer dies relatively quickly in the movie and it's just i don't know so good Overall, The Exorcist 3, like I already said, I think The Exorcist is a masterpiece and it's a better film objectively, but I enjoy watching The Exorcist 3 more and I rewatch it more often. So I would give The Exorcist 3 five ghoulies. Five ghoulies. I love it to death. Absolutely love it. I've got the Brad Dourif single too because that was yeah. beautiful. Five uh, ghoulies, five ghoulies, and they all have the Brad Dourif single tear running down. <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 Larry, is that was that Andrew's performance or <laughs> and just just his his recitation of his beliefs on how great Exorcist Three was? It brought just one tear to my eye. Only just one. one. Only oh, one. Just one. <laughs> but Arlie, what do you got for ghoulies? What do you think I got for ghoulies on this one? <laughs> uh yeah, so everything that Andrew said, uh yes, yes. Uh the performances, Brad, uh George C. Scott, uh uh Ed Ed Flanders, every, even even the the uh Supporting cast do such a, a wonderful job in this movie and telling this story. The story is 
complex, but it's not it's not A twenty four complex. Like it's mm. not trying to it's not trying to be artsy or it's just it's just a good good story, good storytelling. So um and and I watched this sequel more than I watched the the first film. I think I've only seen the second film twice, uh maybe three times. So I am gonna come in with I'm giving this one five. This gets five for me. But, but only four of them have a single tear. Oh. The the last one, he's banging his fist on the uh, on the ta- on the desk and saying, "It's not in the file. It's not in the file." <laughs> <laughs> what are What are you telling me? <laughs> how did we How did we go this whole time and? I forgot to t- mention, sorry, I'm sorry I'm throwing it off. I forgot to mention in my free ghoulie reveal, the jump scare. Yes. Oh, we didn't talk And about we haven't that. talked about it at all. Yeah. <laughs> which, I mean, which... I know it's it makes everybody's list of top jump scares. It's at this point, like it used to be not as popular or well-known, but nowadays it is. But just the whole build up to it, and it's every time I watch the movie, it still gets me, even though I know it's coming. It's just so, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Agreed. Uh, extra, I... extra, extra ghouly for that one. Oh, so shit. It's, <laughs> oh, it's got six ghoulies. It got, it got a, it six just... ghoulies. <laughs> This is a first, but uh, I'm going to allow it. Sorry. <laughs> is, it, is, it is it a Fabio Angel ghoulie? It's a Fabio Angel headless. He gave his, no, no, no. He gave his ghoulie an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> the ghoulies gets oh. an upgrade. It's an upgrade. <laughs> do the roar. Do, yeah, the, do the roar. Do the roar. Do that. <laughs> J- wait. <laughs> I can't ever do it because <laughs> Jason X evil gets an upgrade. <clears throat> there was something in my throat when I did that, so we did it. Okay. Apologize. <laughs> uh, I am going to come in a little bit lower than both of them. I thought this was a tremendous movie. I thought that Brad Dourif gave an amazing performance, but the pace is a little bit for me, and. It just, I'm not saying that it lost me, but it just, it's not something I feel like I can watch multiple times. It it feels like it was gratifying to get to that point, but I don't feel like it's a journey I'd want to take multiple times. It's kind of a slog. So uh, for me, it's going to be four out of five ghoulies. And uh, Roar, what about you? So I... This was my first watch of this movie. Um, I was having issues with the beginning of the movie. I will say, I will I will criticize it just a little bit. The first half of the movie and the second half of the movie, they're two completely different movies. Um, and it it felt weird getting to the end of that movie. Like it, it was almost like they tacked on the exorcist the exorcism they for did. the namesake of the movie. They did. But the performances alone just this was so well done um and if the performances would have been any any of them would have been off this would have been a terrible movie in my opinion um i will go ahead and and i'm gonna give this um a four out of five as well um just honestly for brad durf's performance alone it gets that way it was that good um and I really enjoyed um, seeing the descent of of the main character go down. Like he's wound tight from beginning to end. And then when he finally kind of lets go, he lets go of all of that. Yes, I believe in evil. What are you, you going to do about it? You know, like that's how it came across to me whenever it got to that point in the movie. Um, and it was kind of refreshing to see you go off of the beaten path instead of, oh, I love Jesus too. No, I know all everything's shit. You don't scare me, <laughs> you know? So I thought that was amazing. So yeah, I'm coming in at a four, four out of five. Patton versus the devil. I love it. Yeah. 
<laughs> real good uh but uh that is going to do it for us we're going to get out of here if you want to find out more about the podcast you can do that in a couple of different ways you can start by like us on facebook facebook.com forward slash ghoul kids table following us on twitter at ghoul kids table following us on instagram at gkt podcast and on the tech and talks at ghoul underscore kids underscore table uh, but andrew where can they find you in the world they, of social medias they can find me hopefully on tiktok at andrew horror 31 um i should be unbanned by the time this hits the uh, airwaves um i have instagram i believe it's andrew horror 31 as well letterboxd if you're into letterboxd um same on letterboxd same on YouTube. I haven't really posted much on YouTube, but I'm trying to figure out what I want to do. So hopefully that gets rolling. And I think that's it. I think that's all I have. I'm pretty sure, yeah. Follow him on all those places. Rar, what about you? You can find me at the Tickum Talks at Tragic Rar. That's R A W R. It brings my morning. heart joy in the morning. <laughs> this sounds like a radio station. <laughs> the R-A-W-R best radio station. You are in the morning. Hard the rock. Best, the best radio station. Kicking your morning off with Headstrong. And Arlie, what about you? Oh, you can find me on TikTok, Arlie Grind, or Top Shelf 4. You can find me on Instagram, uh, Top Shelf 4. You can find me on Twitter, R T T S H. Facebook, Top Shelf 4. And we have a Discord. Uh, links are in my TikTok profile. I believe they're in Roar's TikTok profile as well. Uh, and, the goal kids, with- and the Gold Kids oh. table profile as well. Okay, so. excellent. So yeah, so come join our Discord. Uh, things are fun. Occasionally horny, but things are fun. <laughs> Occasionally girthy. <laughs> There's some girth. There's, well, definitely some girth. Not not, vi- not visual girth. We don't allow that. We, that's a hard no. Is it now? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, I've been on Discords before. So, so much pain. So much pain. <laughs> Hashtag so much pain. That's all Discord is good for, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and Larry, Larry, where can we find you? Oh, uh, you can find me on the Tickum Talks at Chunky's Creature Features or anywhere else in the internet world at Creature Pod. Uh, but that is going to do it for us, you guys. Uh, for Andrew, for Rar, for R. Lee, and for me. Again, my name is Chunky. This has been another episode of the Ghoul Kids Table Podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. There's always a seat waiting for you here at the table. Take it easy, you guys. I hate that line. <laughs> <laughs> Take her sleazy. Take her sleazy. Kink, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> all right so we got three minutes to talk before this thing kicks us off three minutes to midnight <laughs> wrong, wrong band wrong band oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> though i do love my iron maiden oh god who doesn't do you, do you, we are born in the world. I should I should have brought this up, but there are two Iron Maiden songs influenced by both The Exorcist uh, and The Exorcist Three. Are there really? I didn't mm-hmm. know that. Well, loosely, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bruce what, is Dickinson. Big, yeah, Bruce Dickinson is a huge fan of mm. horror movies, and he really likes both those films. Nice. No comment. No comment on the second. So, <laughs> but he said they influenced. Uh, oh shit! What's the name of the song? It's not "Number of the Beast," but uh, they're on later albums. Uh, fuck. I know it too, but I'm blanking out completely. To okay, be you know, you know, what I'm talking about. I know which one you're talking about. Oh, and we should have brought this up. I just looked up the cast real quick. Patrick Ewing was the 
angel of death. That was his official. Angel of death. <laughs> angel of dunks, more like it. Death by dunk. <laughs> death by dunk. <laughs> one right on your head. <laughs> I want to see that movie now too, please. Thanks. <laughs> He's a hired hitman. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us yeah. today. You're thank always you. amazing. Thank you for inviting me. This was fun. And thank you for the pick too. Like two of us hadn't seen it before. Yeah. So that yeah. that's pretty awesome actually. You don't that's get that cool. too often. Yeah, I didn't know you guys hadn't seen it. That was pretty cool. Usually when we pick a movie, we try to, we kind of, you can guess here and there how we feel about it individually, but we won't talk about it until the show. Right. I had a other pick. I sent Larry two choices and he picked The Exorcist. The other one was The Killing of a Sacred Deer. Mm -hmm. Anybody seen seen that one? It's a little, it's a very bleak movie. Is it, is it as good as a wounded fawn? (laughs) <laughs> Hashtag furiously masturbating in the sink. His Hooters. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're about to get kicked off of here, but uh, thank you guys so much. Love you all. Thank everybody. It's so beautiful. I love, you I love it so much. So I can't stand it. I'll probably see you guys later on the oh time. I don't know why I'm like, I need a hug. I need all the things. <laughs> I just one, can't one tier. Stand you guys are overdoing it. One, oh, one tier. Only one tier. Sorry. <laughs> Only the one. <laughs>